Minutes as we celebrate Black History Month at the Clinton Presidential Center. My name is Nate Thomas, and I serve as the Senior Educational Programs Manager of the Clinton Foundation. I invite you to visit our website, clintonpresidentialcenter.org slash Black History Month. We have one more upcoming program this month, and we have curated a playlist of past programs and performances featuring Black voices and Black history that you can watch on demand. We are pleased to present this virtual installment of our ongoing series, Bridge Builders, Conversations with Interesting People, in partnership with the Clinton School of Public Service. You'll hear later from the Clinton School's new Dean, Vicki DeFrancesco Soto, who will close our program. Today's program, Bridge Builders, U.S. Civil Rights Then and Now, features leaders of preeminent civil rights museums and institutions who are working to preserve history and make it accessible today as we continue our journey towards a more perfect and equitable union. Our moderator, Lee Sintel, is among the nation's longest serving state tourism directors, having led Alabama's agency for nearly two decades. Along with his fellow state tourism directors, Sintel was instrumental in the creation of the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. He recently published the official United States Civil Rights Trail, What Happened Here Changed the World. Our wonderful panelists include Quantia Key Fletcher. She serves as a director of Mosaic Templars Cultural Center here in Little Rock. Pamela D.C. Jr. is the director of the two Mississippi museums in Jackson, Mississippi. Woodrow Woody Keon Jr. is the President and Chief Operating Officer of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Nancy Rousseau has been the Principal at Little Rock Central High School for 20 years. Central High is the only functioning high school in America within the boundaries of a National Historic Site. And Dewana L. Thompson is the current President and CEO of the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Thank you all for your time and insight. I'll turn the program over to Lee to get the conversation started. Good morning. What happened here changed the world. That's the phrase that we use to explain the U.S. Civil Rights Trail, which is a collection of museums and other destinations that tourists seek out in large numbers. I'd like to start with Key. Tell us something about your sites or your role or your city during the civil rights movement or in today's conversation about advancing social justice. Key? Key, unmute. Thank you so much for having me this morning, Lee. Thank God I have that by now. Um, I represent Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, which is the state funded museum for African American history and culture in Little Rock. Um, the stories that we hold here are so rich to being the only state funded museum of African American history and culture. The Mosaic Templars of America, which is the organization that we get our name from, was one of the country's largest fraternal organizations at its height in the 1900s. I believe the story of the founders of the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center is at the core of what civil rights is all about um, in American history, as the two men that founded the Mosaic Templars were formerly enslaved men. And out of slavery, they decided to create something that should have rightfully been belonging to African Americans, which was insurance, right? It should be something that every African American should have. Um, and it was something that they were being denied. Their organization became one of the largest in the country. Our museum and their business sits in what was considered the mecca or the heart of African-American entrepreneurship and achievement in Little Rock. Here at the Mosaic Templars Cultural Center, we share their story as well as all the stories of African-Americans and civil rights in Arkansas. Did you want to unmute? 
Hey everyone, it's Dewana Thompson, and I'm awesome. It's an awesome opportunity to be here with you all. Um, I think you know what's important to know about the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute is first of all that we are an institute, not a museum. And I think that the reason why it's important to to state that is although we have over ten thousand plus artifacts here, and we function and have a museum and exhibit um, space, we are a fully functioning educational center as well. And so we're not just looking at what happened in a period of time. So the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute exists to tell the story of what specifically happened in Birmingham during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and, uh, and, and, and kind of what's led up to that, to those changes today. Um, however, we exist to tell and preserve that history, but to have courageous conversations and do um, public programming right now so that we can be a thought leader around the key issues that are happening in present day. So that is why it's really important for us sometimes to make sure that we're framing the conversation around a very current narrative, um, because we find that, especially right now, when there's attacks on things like critical race theory and all of these different things, if we're only seen as a place that you know looks at the past, many times we're not seen as an opportunity or a place where we can talk about what's possible in the present or in the future. So that is the most critical, uh, important thing that we want to lift up, um, and we have been lifting up over the 30 years that we've been in existence. Um, it's the fact that there is a story that we need to learn. There are, there are strategies from that past, from the 50s and 60s, particularly when you talk about the children's crusades, when you talk about Martin Luther King being here in a Birmingham jail, um, all of those different things that we actually tell those stories throughout the Institute. We also have public programming in our Birmingham City Schools and in our Jefferson County Schools that teaches that history every single day and teaches young people how to activate and, and intergenerational conversations about how to activate now. So that's important to note right now about the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute. Thank you. Pamela? Good morning, good morning. Thank you so much for having me here today. I am the director of the two Mississippi museums here in Jackson, Mississippi. The biggest question that should be asked is, who would have thought that there would have been a civil rights museum in the state of Mississippi that state, that's a state-funded museum? We were ground zero for the movement here in, in Mississippi. And the most important thing that I can tell you and be very short about it is that these were regular people regular people who did phenomenal tasks to make sure that I could stand on their shoulders. We go through a myriad of, of, of galleries that we have here at the, at the two Mississippi museums, but specifically the Civil Rights Museum, where there are eight galleries. One of the most important things that I could tell you is that when you go through gallery two, you see the monoliths. These are lynching monoliths of all 600 names of people who were lynched. And these are documented names, not the people that are, are undocumented, but, but these heroes and sheroes who gave of their lives for someone like me to be in this position. Yeah, it's when you walk, when you go to your museum, seeing that list really is uh, stunning. It, it brings it all real. Uh, Woody? Well, thank you, Lee, and it's a pleasure to be on this distinguished panel. Uh, the mission of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center is to pursue inclusive freedom by promoting social justice for all, building on the principles of the Underground Railroad. Uh, the Underground Railroad was the original, the world's first social justice movement. Many people don't, un know, don't know that. And what we do is build on, uh, we do three things. Uh, our, we basically educate we inspire and we advocate. So we think it's important for people to understand the authentic truth about what's going on, how the slavery, how it impacted the world, uh, how it made this country. Uh, we also think it's important to inspire people to bring about the change that that's necessary and also to advocate when there's a significant uh, change that needs to be made in terms of policies, practices, and things like that. We think it's very important to, to basically advocate for those changes. So those are the three core pillars of the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. We really try to work hard to connect the past with the present, uh, to show people how the things that people thought may have disappeared a number of years or so ago still exist today, but they are in different forms than what they might have seen back in the time when chattel slavery was alive and well. Thank you very much. Uh, when, when did your institute open? Our institution opened uh, its doors in 2004, August of 2004. 
We were legally formed up uh, in 1995, May 9th, 1995 is when we legally formed up. It took us uh, quite a while to open the doors, but we've been here ever since. Well, Nancy, you have a, a totally different uh, totally different function uh, versus uh, the museums that we're hearing from. Uh, please tell us about uh, your, your amazing uh, role and your amazing uh, destination. Well, it's, it's an honor to be part of this panel and to be the principal of Little Rock Central High School, which changed the course of history um, in our city, in our state, really in our world um, in 1957 when the Little Rock Nine attempted to enter Central High School to get an equal uh, education. Um, because there was a time when students of color were not included in our school family or in schools all over the country. So we are so proud of the fact that we are a National Historic Site under the National Park Service. And um, now we are a loving, welcoming community of, of, of students um, and community parents and staff. Uh, we serve over 2,400 students now who come from families where they now speak, where they speak 32 languages in our school, which is incredible. We promote inclusion, we promote tolerance, and are so proud of our history. Every child who comes to this school knows the history of the school, even before the first day of school, when we have our preschool uh, transition meetings. And then every single child who goes through civics in their freshman year gets to go across the street to our visitor center and actually connect with the, the videos and, and, and the stories of what happened in 1957 when the Little Rock Nine first came to and integrate our grade school. Thank you. I'd like to ask each of you to tell a little known fact that about your location that uh, might surprise people, something that's not in the history books. Uh, okay, uh, let's start with Key. A little known fact, uh, I don't think that the Mosaic Templars of America is in many history books, uh, much like the story, amazing story of uh, the African-American experience here um, in our country. Uh, the Mosaic Templars was a fraternal organization that was started in the late 1800s by two formerly enslaved men. And what they did in the heart of Little Rock was absolutely amazing. They went on to not only create a business, um, but they were a civil rights activist. Uh, they created a nursing school, um, a hospital, a savings and loan, a publication. Uh, they were in the heart of the Black Business District of uh, Little Rock. So not only the Mosaic Templars of America was a, a million dollar business, but also in the little in the middle of Little Rock, the historic West 9th Street, um, there was um, millions of dollars of African American achievement and business that th absolutely thrived. And we know most of those places are not talked about and don't exist anymore. So I think something that's probably little known history about Arkansas and specifically Little Rock, but even all, all across Arkansas are these amazing African American uh, black owned uh, cities and communities that thrived and that we still have amazing entrepreneurs that thrive all over our, our great state of Arkansas. I think so often people think about one particular story when they think about Arkansas, uh, but Arkansas led the, label, led the way when it came to entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and education. Um, and just really immediately after reconstruction, African Americans were legislators and they were leading the way in policy in Arkansas. On a personal note, are y'all open this afternoon? We are. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come by after lunch. Oh, good, good, Lee. Thanks, uh, Pamela. What a great question. When you think about Jackson, Mississippi, and you think about where we're located downtown, so many events happen downtown. We are uh, when when we, I I. I go outside and I face the front of the museum, what I think about is that behind us is the trademark building and the fairground. 
where so many children were taken to, to, to jail in the fairground. They were put in the stalls and were fed out of troughs during a protest. High school students from Linear High School, Jim Hill High School here in Jackson. And in front of us, it was a read-in at the library, the public library. When you walk outside of this museum, I always say that it, we're on sacred ground because the ancestors fought all throughout the city of Jackson and the state of Mississippi in, regard is, in, in regards to the civil rights movement. Are you still having a lot of traffic? Uh, I, I visited the museum during the first week of operation and uh, it was absolutely packed because people were so thrilled to, to see that open. I know you're not having uh, that, that kind of traffic now during COVID, but uh, have school groups started coming back yet? Oh, oh, we have like sometimes three and 400 children in the museum. And that is because we offer, we have an endowment where high school and junior high schools and elementary school children can come into the museums free if they're under the Title I uh, program and they even eat lunch free. So yes, we're, we're having them come back. The numbers are not 450,000 like they were, but because of COVID, but the numbers are climbing back up. Thank you for Thanks. asking. Thanks, Woody. Thank you, Lee, and congratulations, Pamela. We're trying to get our numbers back. Uh, we're still very low on our group tours uh, at this point in time. Uh, but I think that uh, from my perspective, uh, people, the little known fact is that people don't realize that we have the first permanent installation in the world uh, with regards to modern day enslavement. A lot of people kind of think of us as working in the past, but we also we have the first. It's called invisible slavery today, and that covers primarily human trafficking, uh, sex trafficking, forced labor, all of these things, mass incarceration, all these things that people tend to not view as slavery, but uh, we we take them as uh, as a connection uh, to what is happening today from what has happened in the past, and we try to build and make those connections and show people what what they are and what the implications might be for us. Thank you. I assume that uh, people who come to your location are also likely to be the ones who would continue on to Montgomery uh, to the Equal Justice Initiative uh, Memorial and Museum. Yes, we, uh, we're at a great location, actually, because people will be heading down south to Montgomery. And also there's a Charles Wright Museum that's up in Detroit. So we're right on I-75 and it's a really good uh, transition point to hit those areas as well as uh, on the way to Memphis, which uh, I I've been to several times. Good. Thank you. Uh, today's program is focused on the then and now of civil rights. And one of our audience members submitted, submitted this question. Our country continues to confront issues of inequality and inequity. What do you see as today's defining movement? Key? That's an amazing question. I think, um, there is not, I, I would not say that there's one particular thing, but if I could touch on one, um, one of the ones that I would want to touch on is the, the inequity in terms of the racial wealth gap. Um, I think so often we are bombarded with a lot of information today, but I don't know if we're actually truly looking at uh, what's happening now, but also research. One of the things that I will really encourage teachers and people to read slavery by another name with uh, Arkans and Douglas, Douglas Blackman. He talks about how African Americans have been systematically denied the opportunity for growth and advancement by um, illegal, well legal at that time, practices of being in jail. We're still seeing some of those things happening today, many times for petty or phony or trumped up charges. And so what was happening then is, then if, if you're in jail, then you can't earn wages for your family and then you're unable to pay fines and then they're in prison. Uh, another example is The Color of Law. It's another great book. Again, it's an example of how our country um, through governmental policies has consistently denied blacks the opportunity to for home ownership, for property, um, thus kind of limiting the ability for African-Americans and others to create generational wealth. Um, and keeping them in low income situations. Um, and that's something that has happened for hundreds of years and things that are still happening. We see issues today where uh, property values are less if you live in an African-American neighborhood or if you're African-American and you live in a particular neighborhood. Um, I think that this is something that we, uh, one of the civil rights uh, issues that we're still dealing with and that we continue, it's an ongoing struggle that we need to deal with and work through. Yeah, well. Yes. Um you know, 
I didn't get the chance to, to answer the previous question, but the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute sits across the street from the 16th Street Baptist Church where the four little girls were bombed. And consequently, two young black men were also killed on the same day that many people don't know that story um, and understand the the what's critical behind that. So when I think about what you know, some of the most pressing issues that we're facing today, I think it is the uncovering and the reemergence of white supremacy in in our cities and in our in our schools. Um, the fact that just last week or two two weeks ago, um, over 15 HBCUs received bomb threats in 2022, that lets us know that we are seeing a revisit, or if you will a rekindling of a certain kind of intimidation tactic and a certain kind of way in which our communities um, are being um, systematically uh, enforced upon with fear and, 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 and the kinds of strategies that came about when we were trying to push the needle around voting rights. And we were trying to push push people out of Jim Crow. And we were trying to push people into making sure that black women weren't being sterilized. And we were trying to push this country in a certain kind of move. And so I think that we are really having to go back and teach a lot of those um, have a lot of those conversations around what was the response of our leaders and our ancestors um, and, and the community and our allies during those times so that we can accurately and um, respond right now to that reemergence that we're seeing, or what I just say, that uncovering that's been there sort of in a lot of our Southern cities, particularly um, that that unseating of white supremacy, that unseating of, of this conversation around value and worth as it relates to people of color. Thank you. That's, that's very powerful. And, and you're obviously on target. Pam, Un unmute. Dewana, thank you for that. You know, what I was thinking about was civil rights and we're, we're still trying to suppress history. That's a narrative that has not, that narrative has not changed. And until our children can know the absolute truth, we'll never be able to move forward. So that for me is one of the biggest problems that we're having right now, because nobody's understanding what they're talking about when they talk about CRT. And, and, and that's not what we're teaching our children. We're just teaching our children history. So if we can change that, narrative, whereas that we can authentically talk about, the, tell the truth of our ancestors and, 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 and exactly what happened during that time, we will always stay uh, in, 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 the, in the background. We won't move forward. Thank you. Woody? Yeah, thank you. This is great, great, uh, great uh, points that have been made. And I want to kind of go back to where I think he started a few minutes ago and that uh, it's not anything new that's going on. Uh, this uh, what we're dealing with basically a continuation of problems that have existed for some some decades, centuries, and so forth. And the reason is because we're dealing with what I call and what many people call systems of oppression. So when you talk about these issues that are systemic in nature, our educational system, the political uh, system, these things impact and they're all interconnected in various ways. The education leads to every other things and uh, political power, it leads to ac economic and wealth. And, and every time that we've looked around when uh, African-Americans have fought hard and, and, and has had uh, black and white and uh, our Jewish friends fighting along with us to make these progress, there's been a significant backlash uh, from uh, from from people trying to take us back to where we were before, and that continues today. I mean, uh, you go from uh, Reconstruction to uh, coming up to the Civil Rights era. The, you know, you live, went through Jim Crow and so on and so forth. But until we can uh, disrupt these cycles of oppression, these systemic racism and, and institutionalized racism that are embedded in our laws, practices, and policies, and and so on and so forth, uh, we're going to continue to fight this. It's, it's like uh, one step back, one step forward, two steps back, so to speak, sometimes, or two steps forward, one step back. You're making progress. Uh, I won't deny that because I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. I know what it was like. I remember the, barely remember the central uh, high school situation, but I, I understood. And I, I knew the importance of it. And that's one of the things that inspired me so much because my parents made it uh, essential or, or absolutely necessary for me to get an education because of all of the, the struggles that the people that made it possible for me to get an education went through to, to make it happen. So I think it, uh, we've got to think about it from a systemic standpoint, 
at various levels, individual level, in a personal level, institutional level, and also society level intent until we can disrupt these uh, cycles or continue to make advancements in them. Uh, that's what it's going to take. So the principles of the Underground Railroad, basically courage, cooperation, perseverance is what it takes. All, all three of those elements have to be working in order to get the progress that, that it takes. And it takes some time. That's why perseverance is important. Thanks. Nancy, you're having to deal with subjects like this in, in real time as people, as some states start to say, oh, no, we can't have discussions that are going to make kids feel bad. I mean, this is a this is a strange development in education. How are y'all dealing with, with this movement? Well, uh, I'm going to jump and tell, I, I have to tell this fact because Kids will love this, and it's so little known. Um, Ernest Green was the first of the Little Rock Nine to graduate in 1958. And what is really very few know is that Martin Luther King came to his graduation and sat with his family. Oh wow! And I just, I just, people just don't know that he had not risen to the height of his uh, of his distinguished history at that point, but um, I, I think kids would enjoy knowing that. Well, yes, education obviously is the root uh, of all of this. You know, we have made some improvements, but there are still great disparity gaps that exist today. So we work very hard with our students to understand that we're not just preparing them for le as to be leaders uh, of the future, but to be leaders right now. And um, that's how we're going to have the positive change. And we want our kids to have a voice for positive change. Um, when in the past years, we've had these national uh, conversations. And so we have worked with our student leaders to allow them to share their voices in a very respectful, meaningful, and uh, non-disruptive non way. Uh, and um, to uplift our community and though, and then to work with those who need assistance. And we do this as much as we can every day that, this, that the doors are open at Little Rock Central High School. Have you talked to other principals about how the political conversations when legislators or congresspeople uh, get, or get in the news, about certain topics that, oh, they can't talk about that. I mean, it, is, this, is this something that we see more of just on uh, political talk shows or is it real in the classrooms? Um, I don't find that it's a problem in our classroom. I, I think that uh, with the diversity and of course, I'm speaking from my school, yes. which has this tremendous diversity. Um, of, of student backgrounds with, you know, when you have third, when you have kids in your school who speak 32 different languages, uh, kids are learning from each other every day. Would and, you go ahead? No, would you it, go back to that 32? Because you told me that earlier and I think people would be amazed to, to hear that fact. What yes, is, we have students from all over the world here and that has made a huge difference. I, as an educator, I am very proud of the fact that we are so heterogeneous. And I believe that a school that is heterogeneous has a much better chance of uplifting children to work together to change our world uh, because they, they, they are different and they do learn from each other and they're in classes together every single day. We've just recently even gotten families from Afghanistan and that has been a tremendous um, uh, learning experience for our teachers because these kids don't speak English. And so that's, I mean, to have other children look at them and understand and realize that they, they don't, under, they can't understand what I'm, they don't understand what I'm saying, Ms. Russo, but we're going to help them. So, I mean, I've got the whole school involved in this and, and helping these kids to, to get an education here in our country a free education um, where they're not afraid every day. My mother was a history teacher, and that's why I like this uh, next question uh, that has come uh, in from, from the outside. What one or collection of artifacts are y'all 
collecting now that will help tell your story in the future? Maybe something that people wouldn't expect or something that was, was kind of different. Uh, let's start with Key. Um, I think one of the things that people probably would not expect that's different is right before or like right as COVID was happening um, and we were preparing to go home for what we thought would be a few weeks. Um, I realized that this was going to be bigger than we imagined um, and, and immediately our team, we started working together while we were working at home to start a collection called COVID in Black. Um, and and what we did is we wanted to make sure that we were documenting the African-American experience in relation to COVID. And so I'm super proud um, that we started doing that, having no idea how much COVID would actually impact the museum um, as a whole. Uh, last year, my mom died of COVID and even our facility manager at the museum died of COVID. And so we have taken great pride in documenting the COVID um, story in, in, black, in the black culture from everything of photos of black preachers in the pulpits and it being empty um, to black kids with masks on to Easter, you know, Easter egg hunts uh, where ch kids are social distancing um, things from black doctors who have been, uh, you know, you know, right there with families. Um, and so it has been our great pleasure to begin to document the African-American experience. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, frontline workers and who's represented and how COVID has disproportionately impacted the African-American community. And so right now we're collecting um, pieces for, the, for COVID and Black Art Project. We're super excited about that. It's not something that we, you know, we never would have thought of when we opened several years ago, but it's been a really key in making sure that we're abreast um, in what's happening in the African-American community right now. Ms. Thompson? Well, Key, I mean, you have my, you know, sympathies, but also thank you for being um, a champion of what's happening currently and keeping up to date. And I think that's what many of our spaces are trying to make sure is that we remain relevant um, to what the, the course of sort of what social justice looks like right now and what people are advocating for right now. And so one of the things that we have really been working on is this conversation between, um, especially on the heels of the World Games coming to Birmingham, is this conversation between activism and sports and what has been um, the relationship between black and brown bodies to use their platforms to try to tell about what's happening in black and brown communities. And so what we've been doing is showing the relationship between sort of even like the first black NASCAR driver and the most current win for Bubba Wallace and have that conversation about why why there are still people when i went to the nascar race myself still talking about um or, or we're flying hitler flags when bubba wallace came out that happened that was a real thing i saw it and so the fact of the matter is that there's a real conversation still going on right now when we talk about colin kaepernick you talk about all those different things and you would not have necessarily thought that that would be something that the birmingham civil rights institute will be thinking about but we actually have a rich history here with the negro league and everything else and so there's always been a relationship Relationship. And I'm sure with that rings true across the spaces that all of us are in between sports and activism and using it as a platform. So we've been lifting that up. I'd also just like to briefly say that because of what's going on, particularly what happened in 2020 around George Floyd um, and the Breonna Taylors and the Ahmaud Arbery's, we found it very, very necessary to talk about the most current frontline activist, right? So we are not just talking about the activists who were on the front line on, on the Selma Bridge and the activists who were on the front line for the for the Children's Crusade or the mega Evers of the world. We're talking about the folk who are actually right now going to jail for freedom and we're giving their profiles out and we're talking about the issues that they care about so that we bring voice and credence to the work that they're currently doing to push America forward in, in this way. The last time I was at the BCRI, the mayor was in your boardroom with a dozen students from Carver, and the mayor looked like he was ready to go play basketball. <laughs> he is a, a young 40, and I'm a young 38, so that's a good thing for us. But he was, in, he was engaging yes. uh, those kids that couldn't have been over 15 or 16 yeah. and had a real dialogue going. I was, I was very impressed with how... He could take an hour out of his day to interact with those young kids. I guess that's why he got 
reelected pretty easily. <laughs> well, I tell you this: his hero is Fred Shuttlesworth, which is one of our heroes and one of the names that we speak about so much here today. And the work of Fred Shuttlesworth continues here today. And so the fact that we're able to link those missions and the and the moments and the and what's real right now to what was going on during Fred Shuttlesworth time that's the that's the secret sauce of spaces like the Two Mississippi Museum and the Freedom Center and 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 Mosaic. It's the, it's the linking of things so that we can have something to root ourselves in for what we have to do in today's society. And people should look for the book, uh, The Fire That You Couldn't Put Out, is in that his biography. Yes, and so it's, it's an incredible biography. It's stunning, great. Pam. You know, I, I was sitting here thinking about what was going on in regards to COVID and I thought about uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, marches that were going on during that time. And we had one of the largest marches when you connect with the marches uh, marches of yesteryears. And what I did was a cry out for protest signs because we needed to have that as artifacts. I have one sitting actually behind me with the Afro and the hands up, don't shoot. And so it was important because it was so many young people. It was young people who put that march together. I think the youngest may have been 17. And so they were able to get people rallying out on the streets of Jackson, Mississippi, and even our elected officials were in those lines. And But that was important to get that information so that we would not be, we would be able to curate those pro, those protest signs and to have them so for generation and generations people can see that uh, to be able to organize mobilize strategize those things are still being put in place in order for us to to get to that place that we say that things would be better for all of us well Woody, as you pointed out earlier uh, your location goes through a, a wide range of parts of the movement over the years. Uh, how, how have you found uh, this to uh, generate interest among all age levels? Well, I think it's uh, pretty much, uh, as I pointed out earlier, what we're trying to do is to really try to connect the past with the present and, and make it relevant to people to understand and see the parallels and connections between the past and the present, because a lot of people have a tendency to say it's, it's over. Uh, so what we've done is uh, a lot of what I heard Duana, Key, and, and Pamela saying is that uh, one, of the area, one of the areas that we kind of see the Black Lives Movement as the contemporary social justice movement of today. And uh, when the George Floyd situation occurred back in 2020, uh, we uh, kind of said, you know, this is, uh, this is a serious protest. It's, uh, it's very, it's global in nature, it's diverse. It, it fits all of the things that we talk about here. So we went out and started doing some of the same things, trying to find banners. We tried to find uh, uh, protest signs, uh, artwork, clothing, anything that we felt would be of value in terms of kind of preserving the history of this particular movement, because it's been there for a while. And I think it's going to be uh, it is the, the, the current movement that's taken us to whatever that next uh, next movement is going to be. And we think it's important for us to document that uh, as part of our our responsibilities here, stewards for this uh, this museum. Nancy, as you pointed out earlier, you're the only only high school that's operating in the country as well within the National Park Service system. How much collecting do y'all do? Or or is is this question a little outside of what your mandate is? Oh no. We um, our school is just filled with um, artifacts from uh, the Little Rock Nine and going forward, our student council uh, came together with other clubs and they painted a huge Black Lives Matter mural um, outside our school that uh, that is fabulous. And another thing, and I'm going to show you, okay, what people, what our kids have done is they have produced two books um, we have a project here called the Memory Project to keep everything in history then and now together. And in 2000, it started in 2004. And we've created these two books of oral histories uh, that the students collected, um, all about insights and perceptions and prejudice, acceptance um, from the civil rights era. The kids, they went ahead and uh, interviewed people of all backgrounds who had experiences during the civil rights era. 
and up to the present time. So we are always collecting. And during the 50th anniversary uh, of 1957, we put together a time capsule. And it is buried across the street from the school. So it's ongoing with us. So you can't come into the school. We have a beautiful display case when you come into the front, front of the school in the foyer, the historic doors you enter. There's a big display to the Little Rock Nine to what they looked like in high school and what they look like now. And um, it, it's, it's pretty fabulous. And all our students, every one of our students in their civics class gets to go across the street and learn everything about um, our school's history. Plus, we are, I think, I believe the second most visited um, uh, building in Arkansas next to the Clinton Library. We have every our kids are like pigeons in Central Park. They are so used to seeing people in the building. Of course, we haven't during COVID, but we get visitors from all over the world every day. How do, do people have to make an appointment? How do how do people tour this National Park Service unit while school is going on? every day or how, or how does that work? That's a great question and I have to tell you it is an amazing. We just worked it out with the National Park Service that with 2,400 plus kids here we still have, now we haven't during COVID of course, but prior to that and hopefully soon again, they just come into the building. Uh, we have a very large auditorium. They might sit in the back and the National Park Ranger will talk about the school. They actually walk through the school. They don't go down during lunch, obviously. But other than that, they walk. They have a special path through the school. And as they go, they tell the stories of the Little Rock Nine when they first came into our building. It, they are not intruding upon what we do here every day. It's an amazing partnership. So the next time you come to Little Rock, you, 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 you'll you see, you come, you go over to the museum, you make an appointment and the park ranger will bring a group over here. And it's so much fun because it's obvious that these folks who come to visit us are coming from all over the world. It's, it's, amazing. Amazing. it's amazing how you manage that. We do. <laughs> is, the, is the enrollment still 50, 50, 50? Um, demographics right now are we are 51 percent of african-american and the rest is just everything i mean we have students as i mentioned from all over the world and uh so we, we love our diversity here in 19 no in 2007 at the 50th anniversary we coined a phrase and of course everyone knows no school is perfect but we coined a phrase that has stuck with us that we are very proud of. And it's Little Rock Central High School, many cultures, one world. Oh, that's nice. Wasn't that, the 50-50, wasn't that part of the uh, decision in 1957 for the reopening of the school or for the, whatever the- Well, the I don't think they put a, I don't think they put a number on it, but the, the our school just has, it's it's 51 percent african-american and that's just the way it is i mean it's not a lottery that we're not picking and choosing uh kids get to come here from you know from our from our attendance zones and it just turns out that that's what it is and it's lovely well terrific um what are some i ideas and innovative ways we can continue to encourage today's students to continue to preserve civil rights history. Key, we'll start with you, to preserve civil rights history. One of the things I think uh, kids and teachers and parents need to make sure that they know one of the things we're seeing a lot, even during Black History Month, is that we are a part of it, right? Like I am Black history, my family, my community around me is Black history, but that, you know, civil rights isn't something that just happened I just started, you know, 50, 
60, 70 years ago, but that is actually happening now. There's some really cool, we even look at the TikTok videos and Instagram and ways that people are sharing the history. So I would encourage uh, communities and I would encourage students to do that. I would encourage them to do TikToks with their grandparents. Um, one of the things that we've seen during the uh, Black Lives Matter movement in Little Rock is amazing ways in which young people are using art um, photography and video to really capture the movement. Um, and so I think that those are really creative ways, but I, I, I would also say use the gift that you already have, right? If, 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 if one thing is not your thing, use the gift that whatever you have to move the movement forward. Um, and then also for those of us who are a little bit older, right, is also seek out those ways and make sure that we encourage people to use technology and social media as a way to continue to preserve civil rights history. Ms. Thompson? Yes, you know, I think the the thing that we can be doing is be committed to having courageous conversations because a lot of um the a lot of reason why I think we get into some of these touch points and these these moments where it feels like we can't handle or we don't have uh, our, our arms wrapped around the moment is because we're not having or willing to have these courageous conversations and i think that that means that we have to be willing to listen we have to be willing to consider we have to be willing to tell the truth right um and hear the truth and be challenged um and i think that that is an important thing um for our spaces to cultivate that sacred space for those courageous conversations right but if you don't um, I always tell people those kind of conversations and getting comfortable with that starts at home it starts in um, the spaces where you're most comfortable like challenge yourself to have conversations around social justice and equity and what do I feel about the prison complex what do I feel about you know, um, food deserts, all of the different things. If we have those conversations in the places where we feel most comfortable, we then begin to form um, the kind of chops that we need to have those conversations courageously in spaces where we might not have normally had those conversations. And so it's a practice um, that I think that, you know, we challenge people to have is to, to have the hard conversations. For instance, we had here uh, one of the city councilors in the city named Tarrant called the black man the N-word um, in the middle of a council meeting and previously i think that there would be people who would have been confused or i would say would be concerned about speaking out about why that was an issue and what i told them the reason why the birmingham civil rights institute was willing to put a statement out about it is because we're leading from a place of accuracy and truth we yes. talked about the history of the word and why the word is an issue and we didn't you know we didn't go into how you should feel about it we talked about the historical context of the word and the impact that it has and that allows us to remain relevant that was a courageous conversation and so young people can do that they can have the conversations they can go back and read the history and they can say this is why we have to have a conversation this is why it's impacting me and so i'm grateful that we have an opportunity um to, to create a space for those courageous conversations what kind of feedback did you get from your statement you know what? We got so much feedback. I think number one, when there hasn't been, um, and 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 I am just so you all know, I'm I'm brand new. I'm here just under a year at the Civil Rights Institute, and for for very many reasons over the last couple of years and with COVID and some other things, I think that there was a shyness to sort of lead from the front on certain issues because there are some real visible, you know, some real um, concerns about how you might be considered, how you might be attacked, resources. We all trying to raise money, you know, um, and you know, and I think that it's a you know you have to think about whether or not you want to put your neck out there, you know. I'm saying uh, on behalf of these things. But what I found is that if we are an institution that says that we are operating um, as a thought partner and as a leader on social justice and a leader on diversity, equity, and inclusion, we can't shy away from having those conversations. But the best way to have those conversations is to root it in truth. And we were when we were able to, th to do that, the pushback was very, very limited because the conversation was around, yeah, you know what? That is an issue. There, you know, that is the history of that word. And there is a, a way that we can have that conversation. So we we had others to join with us in the statement. And I think that's the a, a safer way to do it is to make sure you're not speaking alone, that you're speaking collaboratively with community. Um and, and we 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 did not have the, the, the pushback that I believe that maybe some would have feared. In fact, it was embraced and people look to see institutions like ours have a have a statement or have us take a stand on certain key things that are going on in our community. Thank you. Pamela? The largest institute 
in the state of Mississippi is the two Mississippi museums. What are we doing? We are working together to start a freedom school this summer because we understand that teachers are not able to uh, give the students exactly what they need because we want this to be a, 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 this, like this rubber band where you, you're teaching your children and then the children are teaching their parents. This is what this is as innovative as we can get because we know that our museums are very authentic and they tell the truth. Where else can you get a story, the story about Emmett Till? Where else can you see the rifle that, that Byron De La Beckwith used to assassinate Mecca Evers? So this is how we teach our children because from that, we know that they're going to get the examples of how Mega was and all these people who were a part of the movement and they understand, they understand from this leadership. So that's what we want our children to have. This is what we'll be teaching this summer with our Freedom Schools. We have two different sections of it. We have an elementary group and then we'll have an, a high school group. So it's going to be phenomenal. That's how we start teaching our children about the history. Thanks. Woody? Thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, two areas of uh, emphasis was in our most recent strategic plan, we basically agreed that uh, decided that uh, one of the areas we thought would be very helpful in terms of uh, attacking this area more uh, on a contemporary basis is to put more time and resources against what we call an initiative called Crossing to Freedom, which is basically social activism via the arts. So basically trying to teach and educate, inspire uh, everybody that we possibly can through the arts, uh, whether that's performing arts, we've got collaborations with our symphony, our, our orchestra, with our opera organization, and with some of our theaters here. And we have uh, strategic relationships with our uh, arts community here in terms of bringing programs into the Freedom Center where we can talk about freedom in different ways, selling telling the, the same kind of stories and so forth, but in, in more interesting and different ways that people will have to, to process the information. So that's number one. Number two is that we basically have a strategic relationship. We're just a few blocks away from the Cincinnati Bengals. And we have in our organization, a strategic program in the area of implicit bias training. And we've collab we're collaborating with them in terms of working with fourth and fifth graders in the Cincinnati Public Schools, Northern Kentucky and other areas where we're still early on here. We've got it, uh, COVID kind of, uh, hampered our plans but basically we're going to these schools with virtual programs and trying to get back to where we can go into the classroom teaching implicit bias because i think if you can get uh, uh start teaching these lessons and disrupt this cycle of, of, of biases early on in someone's life i think we have a better chance for the future and so by having this strategic collab collaboration with a professional sports team i find i've been on these calls and everything i see that the students react and respond to these professional athletes a little differently than they do for me uh, so we're planning to continue to grow that program and uh, continue to teach the base principles uh, and tell the authentic stories, but doing it in a different way and using different platforms and using strategic relationships. Thank you. Nancy? Uh, well, by virtue of the fact that we are a national historic site, <clears throat> that everything about our school um, points back to 57 in its history. Uh, everything is about communication, and we encourage our students, uh, our teachers, to visit about uh, the, the history of our school then and to compare and look and see where we are now. We have a, every year we have a great uh, Black history program. Ours is coming up in a week, and the kids are really excited. We get a very diverse group of, of children who were involved in its production. Uh, we continue to have our memory project alive and well, our books. Uh, just within the last couple of years, we, uh, we had a project, Our school, uh, so many people got involved in this, with the creation of an authentic uh, um, um, bench where Elizabeth Eckford, who um, got lost from the Little Rock Nine on that first day of school, and was taunted by so many, ended up on, um, on the bench waiting for the bus to take her home. And we have, we've added that to our history and to our school's um, artifacts. And so really it all comes down, as mentioned really by everybody, about communication, not being afraid to talk about sensitive, sometimes very uncomfortable facts and to in that way to go forward. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, our closing question. Each 
Bridge Builders is always closed with the final question. To end today's one of conversation, I want to ask, what, what is your call to action for today's audience and the greater community? Okay, you always get to start. Yay, I would say no that, um the gift that you have is your vehicle for justice. So often we feel like we have to do something else and you don't. Use the gift that you were given. Here, our gift is the museum. We recently opened the children's gallery and it's the only one in the country from ages two to nine that's designed to teach children and families about equity, diversity, and inclusion of all types. So just know that use your vehicle for justice, whether you're a baker or a painter or a singer, use what you have within you as a vehicle for justice. Well done. Ms. Thompson? I encourage you to visit all of these wonderful spaces that um, are, are here today. And more importantly, to know the history so that you can have those courageous conversations, so that you can be comfortable understanding why something was and why you have an opportunity, you have a divine right to speak out, to say that this is not right, or to say that this is how we can move forward together in love. Um, and so just, just be as curious as possible, lean in as much as possible, and know that the history, the resources are there, whether you are coming to our institutions or whether or not you are picking up a book to read about those leaders, there are resources there for you to feel confident as you go on and do your own activism work. It's important to do that. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you for your great thoughts. Pamela? You know, there's this washerwoman out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. She's passed on, but her quote was, if you want to be proud of yourself, you have got to do things you can be proud of. That's the quote I live by. There's simple things to do in your own community. Pick up paper in your community. Check on senior citizens. That's all a part of rights. Taking care of your community. That's what's first. If you want to be proud of yourself, you have got to do things you can be proud of. Perfect. Woody? Yes, uh, I would ask, ask, encourage everybody to basically go and learn about the conductors on the Underground, underground Railroad, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And basically, uh, my message is uh, once you understand what they did in terms of putting themselves at personal risk to change America, uh, I would ask everybody to be the conductor uh, that you are hearing about. People like Harriet Tubman uh, set the stage and brought a lot of people out of enslavement and went back for many more. And there are other people like that who did the same thing. So my message is simply be the conductor. Well said. Madam Principal. Unmute. I'm sorry. I would encourage everybody to continue to have respectful, open communication in multiple venues. Um, one of the things that I encourage our kids to do is to be role models and to be, you know, it's really easy to spend our time in our own comfort zones. And I think it's really important to step outside your comfort zone. I want our kids to, to learn about each other and at the same time, to remember that Little Rock Central High School is such an icon for diversity and for open open thoughts and open communication. Thank you. This has been a very impressive panel. Thank you all for taking an hour out of your busy day to make these great comments. Uh, to the audience, uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna give a plug to the US Net uh, because in the last couple of years, they have generated so many uh, coins and medallions that highlight not just Martin Luther King and Mr. King, but uh, less well-known figures. And many of these have been referenced today. So I want to encourage you, first of all, to go to as many of these places as you can that uh, we've been talking about today and visiting with. And uh, if, if there's a, a, a grandson or a grandchild that wants to get interested in the hobby, uh, show them some of these uh, not very expensive uh, coins from the U.S. Mint. But there are many different ways to celebrate the success of the heritage of the civil rights movement, uh, while at the same time we look forward to going ahead and, and guarding the gains that have been made and so that we don't revisit some of our history again. 
This is Lisa and Tell with the State Tourism Department in Alabama, but uh, here in, enjoyed my day in Little Rock, and uh, I will turn it back over to the people with the switch. Thank you for joining us for this incredible program today. My name is Victoria De Francesco Soto, and I am the Dean of the Clinton School of Public Service. It has been our privilege and our honor to be in co-sponsorship with the Clinton Foundation. A very special shout out to Stephanie Street and the whole team over at the foundation for helping put this Bridge Builders program together. It is conversations such as these where we get to reflect on our past, learn lessons and apply those to the future that are so important to our growth as a community. I invite you all to continue to tune in to the Bridge Builders program. Thank you.